Hello, good morning. Oh, hey, how's it going? Uh, it's all right, and we'll to Monday. Uh, everything's busy before the next KubeCon. You yeah, I don't doubt it. No, I didn't get funding, so I won't be attending this year, sadly. It's going to be my first one in forever that I didn't get to go to. Oh, that's too bad. So, it was the twenty third. I'm gonna post. I'll post the meeting that link. We'll give it a few minutes for folks to arrive. I've seen a lot of posts about the um, Dell Telco lab and various things happening mm -hmm. there. Are you engaged in that directly? I'm engaged in it indirectly. All right. We could chat offline about it a little bit. Okay. I have been marshalling some support internally, though, around specifically cloud native endeavors and telco. We're starting to see some CNFs that are actually, I would say, as close to cloud native as I've seen so far. And um, it definitely breaks a lot of people's brains when trying to design infrastructure for like an actual CNF versus, you know, an eight gig monolith where you do a one to one box to application ratio. That's um cool. It seems like something to dig into and talk about more. Where where is that? Where can they run, or where are you seeing them being run? You, you the CNS? Yeah. Um, I mean, so this is mostly a packet core that I've been working with. Um. But they basically completely rewrote their whole platform. Mm -hmm. um, since this is recorded and I don't speak for them, I got to be semi careful. Um, but I would yeah. love to contact, get you guys in contact with them. But you know, they've got a 5G SA core, an LTE core, all runs in a single platform. Everything's deployed with Helm charts. Um, they rewrote everything, you know, and go. Um, they've really put in the work. Like they're getting to the point now where they want to have horizontally scaling UPFs, which is obviously like the holy grail of cloud native and telco is how do I horizontally scale my data plane? Um, there are a lot of really interesting things though, when you talk about like what it means from a session manager standpoint of um, how do I migrate an IP, things like that. So, you know, there's still a lot of interesting challenges to overcome, but they've really put the work in to like rebuild their core, like from the ground up to run in a cloud, but it's just, um, it's tough trying to get legacy people to, kind of get pick up what we're putting down, right? So I've designed a couple of um, environments and network topologies with this partner for some customers. And, um, you know, just the fact that you start with a minimum of three nodes because you're gonna allow the scheduler, both the hypervisor layer and the Kates layer to do its thing. Like everybody wants to talk scaling like, yeah, but like how many more boxes do I add to get like two more P gateways? And like, it doesn't work that way, right? Like. You just have total capacity. You need to like monitor and like the overall consumption on your cloud and what you're willing to allow for oversubscription and failure rates and then build from there. So it's been an interesting talking point and everybody's a lot more friendly with Jeffrey now internally because they're like, hey, how do we design this to like actually work? But um, it's pretty cool. I mean, they're really, in my opinion, one of the, the leaders in this, just at least from a um, you know total refactoring standpoint. It's not just eight gig containers with all the functionality shoved into one pod.
as um, far as where it's deploying. I've seen it mostly in VMware. I've seen it in AWS. Um, I've seen some really cool hybrid architectures. I was trying to write it down just as a just keep it high level. The what do we mean? Um, yeah, I, I think saying this like across multiple pods um, versus in a single pod. Yep. And just the notion that you, um, you know, if you're deploying cloud native software, there's an expectation that there's a cloud to consume, right? Like I get people asking like, how would I do a single node deployment? And I mean, the answer is, is it's technically feasible, but it's a really terrible idea, right? Like you at that point have to shift to something like micro Kates or K3S or something, cause you don't have etcd, you know, federated, um, but it just, it's just, it's funny because like now that there's actual software that's coming out that's fairly cloud native, um, a lot of people's brains are breaking just trying to figure out like, okay, but like, how do I still do things the way I've always done them? Like, I want to deploy, you know, two boxes at this edge location. I'm like, probably not a great idea if you're deploying this in Kates. And to be honest, for the packet core, I don't know why you would deploy it that way anyways, even for like private LTE, private 5G where you're doing like small localized deployments. The RAN is a lot tougher though, right? Cause you're probably not gonna build three to four node cloud stacks out at a cell site, but it's a different different challenge. I feel like the packet core is a great use case for diving into these and learning these challenges. Cause it's got lots of control plane, which is cloud native friendly. It does have some gateways in there that are not so cloud native friendly. So kind of gives you like a healthy balance of different challenges to overcome in a deployment. So you mentioned Helm charts. What about actually like getting, how do you, the Helm chart doesn't actually send it. You have to have somebody. How are you getting deployments and sending stuff out? And that's going to be individual, you know, customer dependent. Um, like everybody's going to have their own delivery methodologies, right? So you get all your images, you get all your charts, you get all your manifests. Um, but because it's a um, because it's cloud native, quote unquote, um, it has almost no opinion on the cloud other than you know baseline requirements. So how you build your cloud, whether you're consuming a third party cloud, what kind of pipeline you have, et cetera. Um, that's a case by case basis. You know, I could go in there and manually, you know, type like CLI commands to apply everything if I wanted to, obviously not the best idea. Um, but, you know, we've been helping some people, you know, some of our workflow at the Dell side. So we have like bare metal orchestrator from the telco group. We actually do use Otel for this type of stuff. This part of Otel I can talk about where we basically help customers build pipelines and they can like link labs. Um, but I, in this forum, you know, I don't want to turn this into a Dell sales pitch, but I, I've seen everything in anything. Like I've seen the absolute worst implementations you can possibly imagine. And I've seen some of the coolest implementations imaginable. It just depends on where they are in their journey. Um, you know, one of the challenges with like moving to cloud native software is if you're a very legacy network shop, you typically don't have any teams or processes in place to do things like continuous delivery. So then you go back to people just running cube cuddle commands. Um, are you running into folks that are doing stuff like with, I'm just going to say GitOps patterns and stuff like that. Absolutely. I, I've seen some that are um, like really advanced. So like instead of using, you know, like some vendor provided like workflow engine um, or orchestrator of orchestrators, you know, they're running something like Argo and they just come up with like, you know, actual pipelines to handle all their charts, handle all their manifests and, um, they use all of like, they basically use Git as kind of like their state machine to control everything. Um, see other people push it in through controllers cause they really like the like, you know, API gateway style of things. Um, so I've definitely seen like, I've seen a couple of um, providers in Canada actually that surprised me at how far along they were in GitOps. 
obviously you got Vuk and crew over at Deutsche Telekom. They're always doing cool stuff, but, um, you know, my old alma mater charter, we were doing a lot of stuff in that vein using, um, a lot of the GitLab stuff. So I would say GitOps is probably the most impactful thing that providers can do, like even more so than deploying a better version of a packet core or a RAN or this and that, like actually changing how they do operations. Because I would argue you could use GitOps for even all your legacy stuff, um, all your big iron type you know, deployments if you manage all of your config through manifests and you run it through Git and you get real you know, processes in place, gates, checks, balances. I don't, I feel like there's like this notion that GitOps only applies in a hyperscaler or in Kubernetes when I feel like it's just a paradigm that is just good governance for managing things and you could do it across any of your environments if you're willing to put the effort in. I also find the smaller providers tend to be more GitOps savvy just because they don't have as many levels of bureaucracy to overcome, not as many committees to fight through, not as much shared responsibility, like one team will kind of own engineering through operations, cradle to grave, and so they can be a little bit more daring in what they attempt. Hello, everyone else. Uh, hey, Victor, what are you saying as far as like production deployments, I mean, I know that you're heavily involved on the Nefeo project. Um, mm -hmm. I just put that with GitOps operator patterns. Um, you know, it's, but if you look at the underlying KPT is, I think heavily about GitOps in my mind without that word being maybe directly used, but it, it becomes the same thing. But what do you, you say in like production? Well, uh, just to realize that, for example, Google has this uh, DNA uh, product, which is basically uh, uh, Nafayo uh, production rate. So uh, that's what, um, yeah, which is following exactly the same, like uh, using the GitOps um, practices and, and behind scenes, it's obviously using uh, KPT. Uh, which is, you can, technically you can connect with Flux or Argo, but uh, they are trying to promote like the use of config sync, which is the KPT um, you know, reconciliation system. So, so yeah, I have seen that, that particular trend, like uh, especially like, uh, yeah, the, the justification is mostly because if they want to try to scale up, uh, to, uh, Decent levels. Uh, at least GitOps, you have you have to have in place GitOps. You know, if anyone besides Google is doing anything with Nefio production. No. It's interesting I, to even see this. Is this like a forked version similar to, you know, Kubernetes? Is, was something before it was Kubernetes? Do they have something? I heard like a few weeks ago uh, that AWS were trying to also contribute to NFIO. Hopefully they have like a similar <laughs> Nefayo Distro, uh, but yeah, until today we haven't seen anything. Jeffrey, are y'all using operators for management with the network functions do you know that y'all are doing um, the packet core stuff so uh, i mean it depends because we come you know pretty wide open as far as stack we have some tools that we use operators in for sure um like for some of our internal products around like automation etc like the ability to like you know 
declare different types inside of Kate so that you can manage certain components the same way you would other things. But it's really mostly around like infrastructure orchestration and just being able to leverage the Kate's API at that layer. Um, you know, as far as like what we're doing from like a MANO or an SMO standpoint, this and that, I mean, I think there's some stuff being released, but we're mostly providing like cloud infra and then we're pretty agnostic at the moment. You know, if you want to bring VMware, Red Hat, Rancher, whatever. Um, and then we integrate different, you know, CNF vendors, operators. But um, as far as like our own DU and CU software that's coming out, I couldn't speak to that. Like, um, you know, I mean, A, it's too early. I don't think we're even talking everything we're doing other than that we have a RAN. But, um, you know, whether or not we're leveraging operators in there, um, I don't know. I can tell you that the packet core vendor I'm working with, um, they're just straight manifests and Helm charts, et cetera. Like, they're basically just using everything, you know, that comes from Kate's. They're not trying to, like, modify the API. I would say that I think that the operator craze has kind of calmed down a little bit. I don't know, Victor, if you're seeing the same thing. I mean, they're still out there, but I feel like instead of like everybody saying I need an operator for everything, um, the hype has kind of calmed down and they're being employed a little less frequently and typically in areas that make sense versus just trying to brute force things for the sake of forcing a paradigm that probably shouldn't be there. Yeah, what, what I have heard at least from, from Tal is like, a. I mean, writing a, an operator is quite easy. I mean, <laughs> anyone can do it, but uh, writing a good operator um, with all the best practices and following and, and make it more uh, uh, long-term operator, like it's like a tricky thing, like a, that's, that's, that's a major um, challenge over there. Um, the other problem that I have heard, and, and at least it is something that in the NFIO community, uh, it's a hot topic. It's about the Helm chart. Um, I mean, for small uh, CNF and things that doesn't require too much uh, parameterization or customization, uh, seems like Helm charts is like a, a nice thing. But you are when you have to uh, consider like a multiple scenarios, like when you have to. Uh, expose a lot of uh, different customizations and different parameters and all these things. I think it's going to uh, help chart like a lacking of, uh, like a uh, stability, I could say like a, because you have uh, quite bigger uh, values that touch ammo and when you have to expose everything and you have complex uh, customization functions and yeah, so, so that's similar, at least the FIO. I mean, related a little bit with the, the operator, but mostly like, a, especially the way to, to package um, and, and on offer uh, CNF. Um, seems like Helm charts is, is like a lacking of uh, some of the features, or at least many, many people are still com start complaining about that particular method. I've seen a couple of ways though to, I mean, I think that we probably tried to make Helm charts do more than they were ever intended, which is where people ran into trouble, right? Like you said, for like small modest deployments, they're great, but you know, the, what they're originally there for is deploy application X, Y, or Z. And when you have a multi-tiered application, it gets more complicated because you get into like order of operations challenges. Um, I've, you know, I've seen people just struggle and then build super convoluted operators because Helm doesn't give them quite what they need. Other two approaches I've seen though is um, I've seen several people. It's weird that I haven't seen any like wide scale adoption of one of these types of tools, you know, outside of private implementations. But you see these people who basically build like a Helm aggregator, if you will, or something like something that manages multiple charts. Um, you know, and you can build like a chart of charts, if you will, is like what I've heard some people call it. But honestly, the more savvy, you know, groups that I've seen, um, they're just, you know, goes back to the GitOps question is they either have some kind of comprehensive workflow engine or, you know, they've got some type of, you know, advanced level of knowledge of something like Argo, et cetera, where like they're building real pipelines and they just build their deployment into the pipeline 
And so that's how they're handling, you know, successive charts, multiple charts, charts that have dependencies on stuff, you know, so if I like deploy chart A, I, you know, maybe I can't deploy chart B until A is finished. Like that's where like Helm kind of falls down a little bit, but I've seen a lot of different approaches to, um, you know, dealing with it. I think my favorite approach is probably the GitOps style approach of just building full deployment models in my pipeline and deploying charts when they're needed versus the chart of charts, just because you still sometimes get into these weird race conditions. But um, I don't know. I feel like operators are like one of those deals where you give someone a lot of rope to hang themselves. Like you were saying, Victor, like you can write one in an afternoon, but it's probably going to be garbage, right? Um, <laughs> I've seen though some, like the ones that I've seen, that I, the operators I really like are the ones that make small modifications to do what Kate's does best instead of trying to like redefine Kate's in a single, you know, operator where like, you know, I want to run a server the same way that I run a pod or a, um, you know, a VM in the case of Qvert. So like they write an operator that lets you deploy, de declare type server, right? Um, and, you know, assuming they write it well, et cetera. So now you have bare metal infrastructure that is, um, you know, managed the same way as your other primitives inside of Kate's. Um, but when I start seeing people basically try to like write an NFEO or a VNFM in an operator, um, that's when I think things start going super sideways on people. Would you say um, operators with a single concern or close to a single concern, less concerns? Yeah, I mean, I don't know at what point, you know, like one you know, like one concern per operator. Like, I don't know if it's necessarily the same. I do 100% agree with um, KISS. Um, I just, I feel like the best operators I've seen are the things that like take what Kubernetes already does best and then try to like, you know, apply that to a small subset of things that you want to like include in a deployment, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you know, Kate's is kind of like the fanciest REST API on the planet. So if I'm doing those types of things like fraud operations where I want to push a manifest, et cetera, and I've got other things I'd like to include in a manifest and be able to define and, you know, track state on and ensure that like my declaration is being upheld. I think I've seen some really cool operators that, you know, follow the KISS um, principle and they do like great things, right? Like it, small little things that, you know, vastly enhance the um, the capability of what Kate's is doing from a deployment standpoint. And then I've seen other people, you know, follow the yellow brick road into Oz and just get themselves in a lot of trouble. Like they basically trying to write an entire orchestrator in an operator just so they, you know, their orchestrator's API is, you know, the Kate's API instead of a custom API. Like, I don't know. When you start trying to force Kate's to do things that it wasn't never intended to do, that tends to break things in my opinion, but there's also way better software developers than me out there. So they might do cool things, who knows? I'm regarding the similar uh, trend is, uh, or at least what I have heard is, uh, well, in order to keep it like a, like a simple, it's important to have like a kind of a, not SDK because I, I mean, we have like an operator SDK, but like a operator CNF SDK or things like that, where, where you can reuse most of the things and maybe facilitate the development or like uh, at least provide like a library where, where you can reuse Certain functions or certain functions that are very common on in CNF that you can reuse, especially for because if if you have like a single operator for CNF, eventually you you are proliferating like a lot of operators and and that could be also a nightmare, especially for operators, but for people who have to implement those things. Um, so yeah, I think there has to be a balance between the number of things that you 
you want to deploy, like especially for C your CNF, I mean, you have to provide a whole stack of, of things, or you can reuse things and in which using a kind of a SDK or library or things like that in order to achieve like what Jeffrey said, like a, try to keep it simple as possible. <laughs> Seems like there's an opportunity to maybe examine and talk about operator usage. At NEFIO is, I mean, I'd say it's all about operators and they're trying to figure out best practices around that. And I, I do think there's probably some people that are thinking they could do this path do everything they would do and Etsy Mano and uh, folks talked about how do you do layers to do yang, uh, yang and other stuff um, so there's probably gonna be I would just say there's gonna be some that are maybe too much um, but not everybody's doing that and it's in the NEFAO summit, it seemed like some of it would be around this, a simple purpose or single focus or breaking things up. You may have multiple operators, but they're all specific and why are you using it? But best practices around that, Victor, we've been talking about it for a while, but uh, just NEFAO and deployment, but maybe the focus should be operators which isn't yep. just NEFIO, but operators, but it would be, you know, what are, what's happening there? What are the best practices that could be used there? I don't know if, um, actually, I do think that Dosh Chef from Deutsche Telekom, I think they do have operators now that I'm thinking about it in the Dosh Chef, which uses Flux and a bunch of other things. But it'd be interesting to see who's doing it with, um, you know, more cloud native and uh, flexible automated uh, automation for management and deployments. What are they doing? Are they using operators? And tr try to figure out some best practices around that. And encourage those, Jeffrey. It's, I mean, it seems like it's something that it, I don't think it's going away. I think it's um, maybe not talked about as much. So, and sorry, may, I missed the first part. What's going away or not going away? I don't. I, don't th I think that the buzz around operators has slowed down, but the adoption of them is, I think, becoming um more standard people are going to use operators so maybe helping to try to talk about best practices and you know don't overuse them or don't add too much to them yeah i'd say a lot of people you know who are just consumers um probably using operators without even realizing it which i it's probably a controversial statement because you should know it's in your infrastructure. But um, yeah, when I say the buzz died down, I mean, like, I feel like we've kind of gotten over the hype hump where everybody was just trying to release an operator as fast as they could to show, you know, that they had one and this and that, you know, really that bullet you have highlighted. Um, all the NEPs were like, you know, we're going to do X, Y, and Z with an operator. Now it just seems like it's, we're getting more to the keep it simple, stupid, you know, portion where, people are realizing they need X functionality and they package that cleanly and neatly to achieve a goal. And then they move on. Um, I think, you know, your point about multiple operators, I think my real question is, is, um, you know, as we get more and more mature, solid operators that are actually, you know, worthwhile um, that are doing good things for us, you know, what happens when you try to like manage all of them, if you start to get like conflicts and what they're trying to achieve in the API, um, 
I haven't really personally, like, I thought that was going to be a much bigger concern when, you know, like two years ago, um, especially when everybody was talking about these big, super complex operators. But now that most you know, people are coming in with like limited concerns and just, you know, this operator achieves this goal, I'm less concerned. But the more and more you add, obviously, the more and more risk you have for some kind of conflict if, um, you know, two different operators are competing for the same resources or something. Yeah, and the other thing that I was thinking, I mean, uh, we talked about this a little bit the, the last week. Uh, I, I think the major change what is happening right now, I mean, probably like, a, like the last year <laughs> or some years ago, most of the efforts for operators were like a, try to expose as much as possible, like a, I mean, adding all the capabilities and try to offer all these capabilities to developers and try to sell, uh, sell those capabilities to them. Um, but I guess now I have seen like a kind of interesting trend where who is dictating uh, the capabilities of the infrastructure is mostly the application. So let's say that, that you, you have like a CNF which requires certain uh, Kubernetes version plus certain things. So, so that that's going to say to the infrastructure, I need these things. I, I don't really care if you offer SRIV or like a Maltus or things that I don't need it like that. I think that that's, I guess, the, the major switch that is happening. Um, because uh, now, especially when, when you have people consuming uh, public cloud providers, um, they don't really care too much about the infrastructure like so, so, so developing and packaging your application, saying, "Well, my application only needs these certain features, and that's fine." I, I think it's a little bit particular change that I have noticed. Like, I, I don't know, like, a, it's an interesting trend, <laughs> but, but, but for me, it's like a, a new way to to deploy things. Not, not to make too much emphasis, too much emphasis in infrastructure. Like, yeah, you still have to 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 support all these things, but mostly who is driving the conversation, who is dictating, who has to uh, offer what is the application and not is what the infrastructure is, cap is capable for. I don't know if I explain it correctly, but I, I feel like uh, that's, that's a little bit changed what, what I have seen noticed, especially in the way to deploy things. Did that, I, I was trying to connect, how does that relate to operators is that just challenge in general for the requirements? Well, in that case, like, a, um, yeah, basically, uh, regarding two operators, uh, I guess it's the same thing. Like, if you are a TNF vendor, so, and obviously you have to pay like your own operator, you have to, but I guess the major thing is like, who, who has to, the operator, the CNF vendor has to obviously say uh, what are the things that they needed. And, 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 and probably there are going multiple places where, or like I have seen, for example, in ONAP or like FIU or others trying to collect all these requirements, like a hardware requirements or like software requirements. Mm. So and, and try to enforce the the, the CNF vendors to to specify which are the needs, like uh, which are the things that you, you need for your CNF. So or that could be like your services, uh, deployments, or replica sets, whatever resources that you have it, plus the operators and. and In other words, for example, things like Anoket, where, where where they were trying to develop like a like a platform, like a reference for supporting all the possible combinations. I think that that's good, but I, I think some some special limitations in that particular approach.
You don't want some single um, management thing that controls everything. And well, if it's not like built in, I guess, um, I'm trying to think of this. So they, if you, you want to be able to share your requirements and versions and stuff, um, and you don't want to have everyone require their own Kubernetes version, single nodes, and that's kind of related to what you're talking about before Jeffrey was. No, um, no, well, probably, uh, my, I maybe uh, I can take it. Yeah, I'm just trying, I'm thinking of the problem in general, Victor. It's like a trying to solve it. There's problems both directions. Uh, it's a, a hard problem to solve while you definitely want, while you want the application developers who know the application best, they know what they need. Mm -hmm. You want them to be able to drive that. But at the no. same time, you need to have some, you know, compatibility and, and stuff between them. So, I think that the major changes, for example, in the past, they have to be aware of what the infrastructure was capable of like uh, I mean okay maybe I, I I can improve the performance in this particular way or using SRIOB or things like that but I need to be in contact in constant communication with the operators to see if our current infrastructure support those things and, and I will say those things so I, I think that was in the past where, where they have to have that conversation and say well probably I will need this particular library or this person kernel version because probably the app that I'm developing is it's going to require all these things. I, I think now that the that limitation has been uh, broken. Uh, so because they can they can access to the private or even public uh, workloads easily. Like I, I I have seen that particular trend, which in the development is like I guess removing those barriers. So now the operator can, I mean, the developer, the CNF developer can say, well, I need this particular uh, capabilities and I don't care if for current version supported or because I have that freedom to, to use them. So eventually I, I delegate that and I'm sure that the operators are going to, um, I mean, the, the, the infrastructure operators are going to Solve the particular issue, but I don't really care in my development to have those limitations. Hopefully, that clarifies a little bit more the difference. Yeah, that makes sense. Jeffrey, you got anything? I'd have to noodle on it a little more, I think. All right. <laughs> like when we start seeing a need for compatibility matrix, um, Victor's earlier comment about, you know, kind of having like a framework or something, you know, like common so that people, I don't know. It just, it starts to sound like Yang and Tosca again, where, you know, we have like these defined specifications and, I really don't know. Like I said, I, I have to noodle on it. I, I don't know if the answer is, is just everybody brings their own operator. Um, and the thing is, right, is um, you've got like NEF.io, you know, it's network plumbing. It's not a CNF, right? Um, you've got, you know, companies like Dell and others, you know, Cisco, et cetera, who build operators to manage infrastructure. Um, I, I don't think that like it's easy to come up with like some standard for like, you know, operators look like this, so they're all interoperable. Um, and conversely though, I don't have a good, you know, answer right now for, you know, how do we deal with the version and compatibility issues? You know, um, I don't know. I think operators, like you said, I think they've come a long way and they're super cool. I don't have a great answer at the moment on how I think I would tackle dealing with them at scale.
but, but at least uh, all of our, all of we are agree that GitOps is probably <laughs> the, the only the only clear solution that or the clear path that we have to go. I guess. Yeah, I agree. Like, you know, the more and more I like dive into the GitOps, you know, abyss, deeper I go. Like, I mean, really, all it is, you know, the the second half of the catchy phrase ops is really what it is. It's just doing ops better, right? So if I have a lot of Helm charts, you know, how do I operationalize those Helm charts to do something good? If I have different operators, you know, how am I testing to make sure that I, you know, don't have the conflict and that's mentioned in the first bullet? How do I deploy them? I'm like, I don't know. Um, the only problem with saying like GitOps is the answer is, is GitOps requires lots and lots of work and care and feed. So it's like, like telling someone that, you know, Oh yeah, writing applications is easy. Here's the job of programming language. Good luck. We always come back to this like circular thing of, and I haven't found a way to break out of the circle yet of what's the right amount of like, you know, conformance or consistency so that we can operationalize things at scale, which is a requirement for really running big networks versus not breaking, you know, the openness that makes software to find anything a good thing in the first place. No operator wants to run 15 different SDNs in their network, but nobody also wants a single oper you know, SDN that doesn't really do anything it's really supposed to. I don't know. Just kind of babbling now. Like I said, I need to noodle on this. I don't really have a great thing other than that I think the challenges you've listed are pretty accurate. All right. Um, let's see. So Looking back to so CNF working group um, nominations are open right now for self-nominating. Um, for those that haven't heard, uh, it was at the NEFIO summit mentioned, and it's, more of it will be at the Telco Day. There is a merger of efforts happening between CNCF and LFN, um, especially around certification testing. So what's gonna happen to this working group and the efforts here? What do you want to happen? We need to communicate that. Um, That'll be part of the decisions between CNCF and LFN. Think about it. If you want to post comments directly, post it here. You can reach out to me, and add stuff in. Um, that'll be soon. All right. So no uh, CNF working group. During KubeCon, or this meeting at least, I don't think we should have it. Um, Victor, yes, no, for canceling that one. It is the uh, next week or like uh, after? I think that's fine. We can, for, for KubeCon, we can cancel. So, yeah, we'll be there. All right. Tom reached out to me previously, so yeah, Jeffrey, Rosina, y'all are on with everybody. Yeah, I mean, my schedule is so hectic that basing any cancellation or keeping based on my vote probably doesn't hold a lot of weight, but. All right, I'll just put it. Akash? I'm available, but if this cube gone, then yeah, I'd cancel. <laughs> All right, canceled. Okay, what about this one during the elephant 
dev and testing forum, Victor. November 13th. Mm. So do you know if uh, it's going to be hybrid or? No, I don't know. The only, just saw like the, the registration embarrassment, but I'm not sure if they're going to offer virtual access or. I mean, I'm not planning to go to Budapest, <laughs> so, uh, but I know that there will be some topics about Nefayo. That's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to attend. As long as they provide like a virtual Well, there's some in person. I don't know if it's there's any virtual. Yeah, it seems like just in person, probably. Uh, All right. Well, they're still open for proposing topics. Wow, they're November first. Well, you got to do them on site. No remote presentations. All right. All right, anything else? Nope. All right, everyone have a good day and good week. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Wow. Well.